Give them a hand. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. Thank you for coming. My name is Sang Huang. I'm a senior third researcher at Brook Project. I'm also a pen tester over 10 years experience. Uh, this talk when will be presented. I hope you guys enjoy this talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sun. Um, let me just see if the clicker is working. Okay, cool. Thank you for uh, coming to our talk. So today we're going to be talking about the ASPROX group. Um, and I think one key point of this talk is their ASPROX was um, pretty active. It was uh, launching campaigns with millions and millions of messages daily. And then all of a sudden, at end of 2015, it just died away. Um, people, many researchers believe that they have seized their operation. And we'll, we'll talk today uh, about how this is not true. They're still active. They have just changed their ways of operation. A lot has been published about how their malware works. And that's not our focus today. Our focus today is how they run their operations and how their tools work. Um, how do they infect people? And uh, we're at Proofpoint, uh, Sun and I, and we're, be, we're uh, at uh, a Taiwan Proofpoint office. So we flew all the way from Taiwan here. We'll do an ASPROX campaign overview, how they spread malware, strategy changes from uh, 14 to 16. Uh, we'll be dissecting their TDS server, and we'll talk about their uh, command and control infrastructure economics of their cyber black market, how they're able to buy massively by uh, admin credentials from a black market that they operate themselves. And we'll make a conclusion. ASPROX is a well-known family uh, of malware that's been used, as far as we know, by a single attacker, by a single actor uh, that is Russian speaking. And uh, they have been around since 2007, it, mostly targeting Windows users. They have uh, had success infecting Android devices since 2014, third quarter. And we have been tracking them since October 2014. They're Russian speaking. And malware is not, focus, is not the focus today, but it, it is really their operations and tools. So this group, as uh, I believe many of you know, what they do is they try to infect endpoints by s massively sending out email spams. And um, usually with links embedded in these emails, personalized links, meaning that every single email has a different URL. We call these personalized URLs. And these URLs point to compromised, legitimate, but compromised web servers that will ultimately redirect to malware. And um, they spam using a, a, a wide array of social engineering lures. So um, DHL, FedEx, uh, couriers, coupons, gift certificates, court notifications, etc. They have about 30. Uh, email templates that they frequently use. Oops. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. So. Um, okay. So I'll use that one. Now let's just get over here. <laughs> but I can't see my slides. Um, Okay, they do, they do delivery testing, uh, which means uh, that for, every, e for e every campaign before they launch, they love to use these two services, scan for you and AV detect. And they'll use, and this is what we call delivery testing. So what they'll do is they'll use these services and make sure that their email template, the, the domains that they're using, 
all of the compromised legitimate websites that they have purchased access to and have hosted malicious scripts on, and the malicious scripts themselves, all of these are not detected by any antivirus. And these are the two services that they, that they love to use. These are like VirusTotal. Um, they check scripts, URLs, domains to see if any of these are flagged by any of the well-known antivirus. So this, is, uh, this chart is basically how they operate. They have, the, they have a set of tools which will show you, will show you uh, the screenshots of these tools. They use these tools to pre-configure all of the campaigns that they want to send out and the, the time frame they want to send out. And uh, it's very geo-specific. For every geolocation, they have different email templates and they have different time frames where they'll, and, and they have uh, um, different volumes of messages that they want to send out. They'll send out these email within every single message there is a personalized URL. And these personalized URLs point to legitimate but compromised web servers. And they massively purchase these web servers, uh, the admin credentials to these web servers from an underground market that they run themselves. So when the user clicks on these URLs, they're actually going to a legitimate website but compromised and injected with a PHP script that's developed by this group. The PHP script will validate, will do some validation, um, and then, for example, if a researcher um, tampers with a URL, it wouldn't redirect. If it's happy, it will redirect to a TDS. The TDS server, which, uh, and we believe that this TDS script is developed by themselves. Uh, and they didn't get it from uh, off-the-shelf uh, stuff. And this TDS will further verify the, um, whether the visitor is someone that they do want to infect, whether you're coming from the right geolocation, whether your IP belongs to a crawler, a bot, or a security vendor, things like that, and whether you have visited them more than five times. And if they're happy with all of the above, they will then uh, serve you. The TDS server will come up with a file name, usually a zip file containing malware, and it will give you that file. If the user uh, then extracts a zip, installs and gets installs the executable and gets uh, infected, then their bot uh, will link back to the botnet. Inf um, um, uh, well, their compromi uh, the compromised endpoint will become a part of the botnet and will try to link back to the command and control. Before the command and control, we have seen about more than 50 reverse um, proxies that are trying to shield the actual command and control servers, which are only about one or two. But they've got 50 of those uh, engine space reverse proxies to shield the real C2 server address. And so we'll show you the entire infrastructure and all of the tools. These are what their email campaigns look like, and there's about 30 templates or so. Sending out spam. How do they send out the spam? Um, what they used to do a lot is um, through an SMTP module on the infected PC. So they used to use infected PCs to send out these spam. So they'll install an SMTP module on the infected PCs. Nowadays, what they do, because they have since the since two, end of 205, they have stopped spreading the ASPROX malware. So now they do not have, they have a decreasing volume of infected PCs. Now, these days, they send out these uh, spam emails through a web shell uh, and a PHP mailer on the legitimate but compromised web servers. So nowadays, they send out more from the web servers before uh, it was on infected PCs. 
how do they send out once they have these modules? Either these are just um, SMTP modules, either on the PC or on the server, both the same. Um, they use legitimate but compromised email accounts that they have purchased. Uh, for example, um, like these, and, um, and, and, and they send it out this way. So the emails that are sending these spam out are legitimate but compromised emails. How much assets do they have? Um, they have about 2 billion targeted email addresses that they purchased. Uh, they own almost a million SMTP accounts. Uh, more than a million PHP web shells that support email sending. So these are PHP scripts, um, backdoors that they have injected into legitimate websites. More than a million. That, that also helps them send these out. Uh, and 30 or so email templates. Um, and here you can see the spam backend. This is the, uh, uh, the sender tasks. So you can see that uh, through, the, through this interface, they're able to pre-configure um, um, what, what region to target, what email template to send out. And you can see from the, uh, the, uh, the very right column, um, every campaign, most of these campaigns are more than a, a million messages per campaign. So this is one of their uh, back-end panels. And here uh, we can see that um, it's very geo-targeted. So, so they would configure, their, they organize their emails, uh, all of that 1 billion targeted emails into different databases. And every database contains emails for that particular region. For, they have one for UK, they have one for Australia, they have one for North America, things like that. And this is where they configure, all right? From which, so, so they have this big, big botnet, right? Either from the PCs or from the servers that they own. They will configure, all right? Um, for this set of email, for um, this set of UK emails, when do we when do we want to start? When do we want to end? Um, and, and so this is how they pre-configure all of the campaigns that they want to send out. They can further go into detail, um, as we may have another screen to show you. Um, the the uh, for example the pause between every single email that they send out. Um, and in order to get the targeted email addresses, the SMTP accounts that they use to send, and also the legitimate but compromised web servers. How do they buy these credentials? Well, they run their own marketplace, and they have over 1,600 sellers currently registered on their marketplace. A lot of these, as we later found out, are just um, hackers interested but not really selling. There are about 150 sellers that actually made a sale uh, in, in this marketplace, selling them the credentials. So this is how the marketplace looks like. A WSO FTP account sells for about half a dollar to two dollars per account. SMTP accounts sell for $350 per 1,000 account. SSH root is $20 per account, and SSH user is five bucks per account. And here you can see that this is how you sell uh, web shells to them. By web shells, we mean PHP backdoors. That, so if I'm, a, if I'm a hacker, I massively hack into, uh, let's say, uh, 1,000 WordPress sites. And so on these 1,000 WordPress sites, I have my WSO backdoor. How do I sell it to these guys? You have to upload a text file that complies with their format, and their format is very simple. URL of the uh, web shell, colon, and the password, so, right? So for each line, so, and they have a script that validates this, calculates 
uh, and, and then goes and tests the login and calculates how much money they want to pay you. So it's fully automated. If you comply with this format, you can go and you can sell these to them. And so from what, what we saw in their database, about 150 active sellers that actually do business with them. We were able to monitor them for about nine months, and over which time they, so, uh, they spent 135,000 USD just purely on buying these accounts. So they do have pretty good budget to buy. Um, so there's significant business on, in this marketplace. And they have a dashboard of um, everything that they buy. So good bookkeeping, good accounting on their behalf. Uh, so we, we, we dug into how these sellers are able to massively infect so many websites. And it turns out that uh, it's mostly through open source vulnerabilities to um, WordPress and Drupal, Joomla, and uh, e-commerce uh, open source infrastructure. So um, the sellers, what they do is whenever... Uh, for example, WordPress comes out with a patch. They would go and study that uh, an update. They would go and study that update and say, oh, so Word WordPress patched this vulnerability. And so they'll write a script to massively scan all WordPress websites for whichever website that didn't patch uh, during that same day, didn't upgrade within that same day, and then just inject the web shell. Okay. So... Their URLs, the URLs inside the emails that point to the, P, uh, the PHP script that they inject. So once they have these uh, WSO shells, they will inject an ASPROX PHP script into these websites, right? And the URLs are personalized uh, URLs that's embedded inside emails that points to these injected PHP. They frequently change PHP file names that they upload to these legit web, legitimate websites. They obfuscate and pack malware daily. Um, their malware is the ultimate zip file that uh, a visitor is prompted to download if all of the scripts were happy with the visitor. Um, and, and, and they do a lot of checks. For example, this check checks uh, if, you're try if a single IP tries to download file more than five times, then they'll reject it. Um, and this is, their, uh, this is their PHP code. Um, so as you can see, they, uh, they threw out a 404 response page if they're not happy with the URL. So for example, if the URL has been tampered. And because this is um, a customized 404 page, they wrote this code themselves, and that's why if you know the code, and for us security vendors, when we get an HTTP response that looks like this, we know it's ASPROX. Um, and um, and uh, very interestingly, so, so these are legitimate, legitimate uh, web servers, right? And they're injecting PHP into it. So sometimes the admin will discover that there's, their website has been injected with a piece of PHP code. And so when the, webs, when, when the web admins find this file and they open it up, they will see an IP, right? And, and you'll tend to think that that IP is the ASPROX IP. Well, that's a decoy IP. Uh, it's, it's there. It has no use. It's there just to fake the eye. So if you look at it and you say, oh, here's the IP address. This must be the attacker. Well, that's an IP in China that has nothing to do with them. Um, the real IP that they're, direct, that they're redirecting the visitor to has to be de decrypted. And the decryption code is down there. So you actually have to go through a de decryption process to, to know where they're directing you to. It's a simple XOR. Um, and it decodes to something like this. And um, the personalized URL is interesting. Because within every email, right, there is a different URL. But this URL contains a UUID that if you know the algorithm, 
and it's encrypted in Base64 and AES. But if you know their key and you know the algorithm, you decode it back, then what you get out of that UUID is, is the sender ID. So which bot or compromised web server sent that email, uh, the URL ID, the database ID. So the, uh, which database does the recipient email reside in? And also the mail ID. Okay. Uh, and so it's very useful when you're studying this group because that UUID actually contains all of this information. Um, and uh, if the PHP script is happy with uh, all, all of the attributes, it will redirect you to their own TDS server. And this is how the redire redirected URL looks like. Um, and within it, there are several parameters, the user's IP, the landing file path, the victim's UUID propagated over, and the user agent. And then the TDS, uh, since uh, 2014 Q3, the TDS, uh, other than validating if, if the IP is good, if the geolocation is good, it will also use the user agent. If you're coming from Windows, it will, it will give you a Windows zip file to download. If you're coming from Android, it will give you an APK to download. And that's why they're having a user agent string there. Uh, the, okay, so the TDS itself, the TDS server generate a zip file, um, log the victim data include IP and UUID, ban unwanted user downloads based on blacklist, so they have a big, big list of security vendor IPs, and um, they were vulnerable to directly listing, that's how we were able to study them, they fixed it in the uh, end of uh, 2014. And they have this alert feature that notifies themselves through Jabber of uh, sec snooping security researchers. So if you use a single IP and you keep on hitting them, they'll actually get notified through their Jabber account that, hey, this IP is probably a security researcher and is trying to probe us. And that's their code. We got their code of uh, how, how, how they're leveraging Jabber to do this. Uh, their TDS server changed IP six times and the URL path four times in the past 21 months. So they don't change the TDS IP a lot actually. They have um, four actual and uh, when you're infected the malware connects back to the C2 server through a layer of uh, reverse proxies. Nginx reverse proxies, and uh, they actually total, we saw a total of four C2 servers overall, uh, so only four unique IPs that we saw, and um, spreading about five different malware families. And all of these are located in Russia or Ukraine. Uh, they use Nginx-based reverse, pro reverse proxies to hide these IPs, and uh, they also uh, took some steps to make sure that when these reverse IPs are found out and somebody goes in and look, the, look at the Nginx servers, that you cannot tell by the config file of the Nginx servers where their real IP is. And, um, and they have these decoy IPs. So what they do is when they start these Nginx servers, oh, uh, one thing first. Um, so one characteristic is uh, if you look at their log files, they swap error log and access log. So that's one characteristic. We don't know why they do it, but in their configuration, uh, it's non-typical. Their errors are locked in access.log and access is locked in error.log. Now this is how they decoy. They have the actual configuration file when they, when they start the Nginx servers, and if you look at their script, right after they start the Nginx servers, they then delete that configuration file, regenerate a configuration file with a decoy IP. So uh, if we, when we go in, let's say there's a, there's a server that's compromised and that's been used as their reverse proxy shield. 
Now we go in and we look at the configuration file, we'll see a configuration file with a decoy IP uh, that was generated after the Nginx proxy has been launched, uh, after they start that process. And um, one way they monitor, they, they install these bots, right? They, uh, they used to install these Asprox bots. Another way that they monetize is uh, Asprox later came with URLViewer.dll, and these DLL drive impressions. So it's kind of like selling ads. So when the browser opens, it will open a new tab, and it will load some web page that's paying them money. And uh, they get paid per impression. And uh, this bot has its own command and control that's telling the bot which impressions to load, which uh, web page to load. And uh, we found about 32,000 bots and 167 tasks. And the tasks are telling the bots which page to load. And so that's a different C2 server. And, uh, and, um, and this server is different. It's, it's basically telling the bots to load whichever page that's paying them. And starting from June 2014, we saw that they started to try on Android malware, and they did have some success. So it used to be just zip downloads, and you can see from 2014 June, they started to have APKs. The APKs support these five plugins, uh, steal device info, get device contacts, uh, get your SMS, uh, get your GPS location, and record your calls. During the four months that we were able to monitor their Android botnet, we saw a total of 5,000 or so Android infections. Uh, and this was when they first started to experience with Android. And this was uh, their, their Android uh, command and control panel. The interesting thing is click to final conversion rate is 5.5%, which is pretty high. So starting from a click to, uh, if somebody clicks, then five out of 100 people click actually get infected, which from our experience is pretty high. Um, and you can see, you can see, for example, on the lower right corner, uh, there. You, you, once you get infected, all of your SMS gets automatically sent to the server, and they're displaying for every device. If you click, if you click on any of these devices, you get to the screen where you're able to see um, their last three SMS, and you can click for more, um, and all of the modules that, that it's running, things like that. Their Android C2 server is also shielded by a layer of Nginx proxies, just like their Windows, except they only have one C2 server for their Android, and they're shielding it at the time we were studying them, about nine Nginx servers. Data stolen during the four months that we monitored them. Uh, seven, uh, 752,000 contacts more than a million SMS messages, about a thousand location lists, and uh, about 20,000 email addresses, uh, 60,000 physical addresses, 650,000 phone numbers. Uh, and uh, the phone numbers are important because um, they also started to SMS these phone numbers to further spread. Uh, so rather than using email, they also use SMS, so that's why they need the phone numbers. They love to steal all of the SMS messages. And then they started to run a Android bot rental service, which is uh, you can actually query by, f uh, by place, by, by city, by operator. So, for example, if I want uh, to have a an Android to get to have a control of an Android device uh, here in Luxembourg, I can query 
the region or the city, Luxembourg, and I'll get a list of infected devices, and I can rent that device. So then, then I can ask that Android device to send out SMS or to do things for me. So, so they started to do it, and I think it's 20 bucks an hour, the rental service. Click statistics. Um, within the four months that we were able to study them, you can see that uh, the red ones are the blacklisted clicks, and the, the um, blue ones are the good clicks. So as you can see, on Windows, almost half of the clicks are blocked. They do not serve to half of the clicks. They don't like half of the clicks. We believe this is probably because, like uh, for us, for Poopoint, every single email we scan with our sandbox, right? And sometimes we do get blocked. And so if you have different security vendors, uh, you have Proofpoint, you have Palo Alto, you have FireEye, then actually when an email comes in, a lot of security vendors go scan that URL and some do get blocked. And that's why I, we think about half of the clicks get blocked according to their logs. On Android, much less. And this may be because less researchers at that time had Android sandboxing or were um, using Android VMs to study them. So much less blocked uh, for, for Android. Click the geodistribution. They're very targeted. Um, so they, they have specific databases for every region, and they do not infect. I think they only infect no more than two dozen regions. So, um, so from their logs, you can this reflects where they're infecting, where their uh, malware the down the malware downloads happen. Actually, not a lot. Their strategy change. Uh, we believe that uh, certain investigation bureau took action against this group. End of 2015. And so, all of a sudden, they disappeared. But actually, they didn't disappear. They sharply stopped to spread any Asprox uh, malware, either on Windows or on Android. They just stopped. But the group didn't stop. They started to try for alternative ways to make revenue. And the first thing they tried was the porn and weight loss scams. So they started uh, to test out whether scams can make them money. Um, but all of a sudden, they seized operation on building botnets. But they still actively uh, acquire, compro uh, purchase compromised websites to, uh, to spam out these scams. What they figured out would work is uh, fraudulent dating sites. So they wrote these chatbots themselves. And um, so they built these, these dating sites. And uh, if you pay them a fee, you can chat with ladies. But these are the bots that they wrote. Okay? So the, the Asprox malware guys now run dating sites. <laughs> and they have not disappeared, guys. Uh, so this is what they do now. Uh, they, in order to prove that you're over 18, you have to verify your age. To verify your age, you have to give them your credit card. That's one way to make money. And uh, there's a VIP membership charge, a subscription, auto, re uh, uh, auto monthly renewed subscription sells for 118 bucks uh, to get you to talk to their robots. Uh, so they are not dead. Uh, and they're probably making good money from what we can see. And uh, so uh, they still have a lot of assets. Uh, WSL web shows today buy unique domains, more than 3 million, out of which we have uh, some government and some military ones. Buy web shows by unique file name, almost 8 million. Uh, FTP accounts, half a million. SSH root access, a thousand or so. SSH users, 50,000. Conclusion, um, it's hard to track this group because they uh, use a lot of decoy techniques and they shield their command and control. 
They run their own market. They have good budget to pay. So they keep on acquiring new assets and building these up. Not by hacking, but by buying them. Uh, they change strategy from malware campaigns now to email scams. Mass, uh, and uh, just from the asset that they're able to buy from this underground market, we do believe that mass scale web server compromise through open source vulnerabilities is still very prevalent and uh, remains widely used. Uh, that's it for our talk today. I, do we have uh, time for questions? <laughs> yeah, thank you. We do have eight minutes. Um, hey. How did you get the exact numbers of their assets? Yeah, so um, these uh, attackers, um, usually when we, st usually these attackers have a lot of misconfigured servers, open directory access, uh, vulnerable open source software. So that allows us to get access to all their databases. And uh, of course, as, uh, as we start to disclose them, they will harden these infrastructure up. Um, and so we usually when we start to talk about them, we lose access. Uh, so we, we usually monitor them for a time before we start to publish them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's through misconfiguration and vulnerabilities. No further questions? So you are basically hacking the hackers. Do they hack back to you? Um, we try not to let them. <laughs> uh, usually, usually they know us, um, they know all of the security vendors very well because uh, their command and control panel, if you see their loss, right, half of, like they would launch a campaign and you would see who you would see immediately tons of clicks all from similar IPs, right? Us, Palo Alto, <laughs> just security vendors. So they, they just know the security vendors very well. Um, and uh, we try not, not to let them know that we're studying them. So we, we anonymize our IPs. When, and, um, and also, not only when we research them, but also when we try to scan them. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't know that it's ASPROX, but if they recognize our IP, we wouldn't get the malware. So we don't know what malware they're spreading. We want to know that. So actually, for security vendors today, IP anonymization is the, is the big thing that we have to do well. Yeah. One last question. You mentioned a number of uh, notable victims. Have you done any work in notifying victims, especially with so many out there? Um, so we have uh, a division uh, at Proopoint that works with the investigation bureaus. Um, and yes, so we regularly just provide them with uh, the intel that we have. Um, so I don't, we don't directly uh, notify them or participate in the takedowns. Uh, but these barrels work with, uh, there, there are quite a few takedown vendors that do this. Uh, and they do this professionally. So, um, so that, that's how the process works. We, we hand the intel over, and I believe what those guys do is they work with the takedown vendors. Yep. All right. Well, thank you a lot. It's All not right. the first time we see someone at Hackloo hacking the hackers back, so <laughs> good job. And let's say thank you to All right, Wayne thank you and guys. To Thanks.